Today's episode of the Gone Fission Nuclear Report is brought to you by Floor. We're building a better world. Welcome to the Gone Fission Nuclear Report, your one-stop source for all the latest news from the Department of Energy's Environmental Management Program. Now, here's your host, Michael Butler. Hello, and welcome to the Gone Fission Nuclear Report. Today is Monday, May 1st, 2023. We're covering all the news from the Department of Energy's Environmental Management Program across the country. We thank our friends at FLOOR for being presenting sponsor for today's episode. The National Nuclear Security Administration will take over as the new landlord of the Savannah River site in Aiken, South Carolina by 2025. And the transition has already started. The change reflects the gradual wind down of environmental cleanup and the increased emphasis on future national security missions as SRS is considered as the new site for the plutonium pit production mission. The unfinished mixed oxide fuel or MOX plant would be repurposed for this mission. The change in landlord from EM to NNSA is a major shift for the site as it confirms that SRS will continue to be part of DOE's long-term national security program with enduring missions. DOE has ongoing mission areas related to advancing energy and nuclear security, promoting scientific discovery and innovation, and ensuring environmental responsibility and management. Programs in these mission areas are sponsored by several DOE offices called Program Secretarial Offices. Most DOE sites have multiple programs operating simultaneously at a site. DOE assigns a lead program office the responsibility for proper stewardship of real property assets at its sites, including maintaining the condition of infrastructure and supporting tenant activities. Typical landlord activities include maintaining safeguards and security, utilities, safety and health, general environmental monitoring, and facilities management and maintenance. DOE landlord programs include the National Nuclear Security Administration, NNSA, the Office of Science, Office of Nuclear Energy, Office of Environmental Management, and others. Here's Frank Rose, NNSA Principal Deputy Secretary, talking to a community group in Aiken about the impending change in landlords. EM and NNSA are, have jointly decided to transition primary authority, accountability, and site stewardship responsibilities to NNSA by 2025. We are working closely to define an effective, collaborative, and methodical transition of landlord authorities. To do so, EM and NNSA have formed an integrated team to evaluate all activities at Savannah River um, and develop a framework and implementation plan for transfer of appropriate functions and responsibilities from EM. The integrated team of senior subject matter experts are developing a transition plan that defines responsibilities, management functions, and capabilities while providing an assessment and recommendations on the timing of a, tra a, tra a phase transfer of functions and responsibilities. Well, NNSA will assume landlord authorities. The EM mission will continue for many years. We'll hear more from Frank Rose and Senior EM Advisor Ike White later in today's podcast. And we'll have today's headlines after this from Fleur. Crew 
Crews have reached two important milestones in construction of a new mercury treatment facility at Oak Ridge. Working on two fronts, crews safely installed the initial equipment at the project's treatment plant site and placed micro piles to help the foundation for the Headworks facility. These milestones are notable as they allow crews to move forward with structural steel, underground utilities, and foundation pours in the months ahead. The mercury treatment facility is central to DOE's cleanup plans at the Y-12 nuclear security complex. The facility will prevent potential releases of mercury into a nearby creek, enabling large-scale demolition to begin in mercury-contaminated areas of Y-12. Valerie McCain, the late project manager at the Waste Treatment and Immobilization Plant at Hanford, has been honored as a top 25 newsmaker for 2023 by Engineering News Record. Bit Plant Site Director Rick Holmes accepted the award on Valerie's behalf at a New York City ceremony. DOE Hanford Site Manager Brian Vance praised McCain for exemplifying the one Hanford spirit and inspiring those lucky enough to work with her. McCain passed away after a brief illness earlier this year. U.S. Representative Dan Newhouse visited the low activity waste facility at Hanford recently to learn more about progress at the waste treatment plant. The Congressman and his staff visited with shift crews alongside DOE officials and VIT plant leadership. The visit was part of a Hanford site tour that included the tank side cesium removal system, the VIT plant, B reactor, and more. We'll be back with this week's Spotlight interview right after this from Fleur. let's take a further look at plans for a change in the Savannah River site's landlord from environmental management to the National Nuclear Security Administration, or NNSA. Frank Rose, NNSA Principal Deputy Secretary, and Ike White, DOEM Senior Advisor, spoke to community leaders in Aiken recently in a public forum sponsored by Citizens for Nuclear Technology Awareness. Here are the highlights of that community briefing. Now, Ike and I are here this week uh, to engage with the local community about the impending transfer of Savannah River from DOE's uh, Office of Environmental Management, or EM, uh, to the National Nuclear Security Administration, or NNSA. Um, I want to wish, um, assure you that EM and NNSA are working closely together to ensure a seamless transition. Indeed, we have established an integrated EM and NSA team to manage that transition. You know, and as part of that transition, we want to ensure we are actively engaging the local community, which has been just so supportive of the site in its various missions over the years. Now, in my brief remarks today, I want to put the transition within a larger strategic framework. And I'm gonna hit four topics. Um, first, I'm gonna discuss the complicated <coughs> geopolitical environment we find ourselves in. Uh, second, I'll talk about the recently released Nuclear Posture Review, or NPR, uh, and the critical role that Savannah River will play in implementing the recommendations of the NPR. Uh, third, I'll say a little bit about NNSA, about our missions uh, and goals. And finally, I'll talk about the EM NNSA transition project. Uh, process. And after that, I'll turn the floor over to Ike for some brief remarks. So let's begin by discussing the evolving geopolitical environment. Now, there is no doubt that 
the United States and our allies are currently facing one of the most complicated geopolitical situations in our environment. Uh, to get a good sense of this evolving geopolitical environment, uh, I highly recommend you read the Office of the Director of National Intelligence's annual worldwide uh, threat assessment. I actually have a copy here. Uh, you can find it on the DNI's website, and I will tell you, if you want to ruin your weekend, read this on a Friday afternoon. You will be totally terrified, and you will not get any sleep uh, over the weekend. But let me just read a couple of the key um, sentences from the report. And again, you can read this for yourself on the website. But it says, quote, in the coming year, the United States and its allies will face an increasingly complex and interconnected global security environment marked by the growing specter of great power competition and conflict, while collective transnational threats to all nations and actors compete for our attention and finite resources. On China, it says, China increasingly is a near peer competitor, challenging the United States in multiple arenas, especially economically, militarily, and technologically. Uh, furthermore, in another document, uh, it notes that China has embarked on a major expansion of its nuclear forces. Uh, the U.S. intelligence community estimates that China's current nuclear arsenal of about 400 warheads today will grow to about 1,500 in 2035. Um, we can't forget the Russians. Uh, Russia is pushing back uh, Washington where it can, locally and globally, employing techniques up to and including the use of force. And we're seeing that every day in Ukraine. And, and finally, and this is another, I think, important passage, major adversaries and competitors are enhancing and exercising their military, cyber, and other capabilities raising the risk to the U.S. and allied forces, weakening our conventional deterrence, and worsening the long-standing threat from weapons of mass destruction. So very complicated environment. We have not faced this since the end of the Cold War, and I would argue this is more complicated than the Cold War. And uh, building on the annual threat assessment, there was the Nuclear Posture Review, or NPR, which was released in October of last year. And it further outlines the threat. And this, in my way, in my view, is the most key passage from the NPR. It says, quote, by the 2030s, the United States will, for the first time in its history, face two major nuclear powers as strategic competitors and potential adversaries. We've never faced that before, and it's going to require us to do things differently. Now, to deter this threat, the NPR directs the Departments of Defense and Departments of Energy to continue the nuclear modernization program. Uh, as you know, the Department of Defense is responsible for the de delivery vehicles, and the Department of Energy slash NNSA is responsible for designing, building, and sustaining the nuclear warheads and their supporting infrastructure. Savannah River is responsible for two key NNSA programs, tritium extraction, and plutonium pit production. As this audience is aware, tritium is used to boost the yield of a thermonuclear war warhead, and a plutonium pit serves as the primary or trigger for that weapon. These two capabilities are on the critical path for our nuclear modernization program. 
Uh, for example, here is what the NPR says about the importance of pit reduction, and I quote, for primary production, the highest priority for the next 10 years is pit production. Restoring the ability to produce plutonium pits for primaries will guard against the uncertainties of plutonium aging today, in today's stockpile and will also allow new pit designs to be manufactured if necessary for future weapons. The two-site strategy at Los Alamos National Laboratory and the Savannah River site will eliminate single point of failure and provide flexibility capacity options, end quote. So the point I want to leave you with here is that tritium extraction and pit production at the Savannah River site are critical to the overarching success of the U.S. nuclear modernization program and will be enduring missions over the long term. So let me just switch real briefly to NNSA, who we are and what we do. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with NNSA, uh, let me just say a little bit about that. Uh, NNSA traces its origins to the former DOE Office of Defense Programs, which managed the Savannah River site until 1995, uh, when it's it was transitioned to its current landlord, EM. Uh, Congress established NNSA in 2000 to consolidate the nuclear security um, work at the Department of Energy, and NNSA has three primary missions. Uh, first is nuclear deterrence. We design, build, and maintain all the nuclear uh, warheads in the U.S. arsenal, plus the supporting infrastructure. Uh, the second key mission is global threat reduction. We work to reduce nuclear dangers by implementing various nonproliferation, nuclear security, arms control, and counterterrorism programs. And the third, and I know there's a lot of Navy nukes in the audience, uh, we work in partnership with the Navy to design, build, and maintain the naval reactors on the aircraft carriers and submarines in the U.S. fleet. Um, so as you see, uh, NNSA's mission is really critical to responding to the threats I outlined earlier uh, in my presentation. And I think it's also important to note that NNSA is not a stranger to Savannah River. Uh, to the contrary, we currently maintain a field office at uh, Savannah River to support the tritium extraction mission and some other missions in, um, to support our nuclear nonproliferation mission. Uh, our NNSA field manager, Jason Armstrong, who's there, and Jeff Allison, uh, who's over there. Uh, there's Jeff. Uh, they are really active in the local community, and we will continue, once the transition is complete, to be active in the local community. So let me now turn to the transition of SRS uh, from EM to NNSA. And Ike will say a little bit more about this in his remarks. Uh, EM and NNSA are, have jointly decided to transition primary authority, accountability, and site stewardship responsibilities to NNSA by 2025. We are working closely to define an effective, collaborative, and methodical transition of landlord authorities. To do so, EM and NNSA have formed an integrated team to evaluate all activities at Savannah River um, and develop a framework and implementation plan for transfer of appropriate 
functions and responsibilities from EM. The integrated team of senior subject matter experts are developing a transition plan that defines responsibilities, management functions, and capabilities while providing an assessment and recommendations on the timing of a, tra a, tra a phase transfer of functions and responsibilities. Well, NNSA will assume landlord authorities. The EM mission will continue for many years. The established Community Advisory Board, or CAB, will continue to provide EM advice relevant to the values and interests of the affected community. DOE is committed to keeping the community informed of the progress throughout the process and DOE has a long history of community engagement and collaboration, which we will continue throughout and following the transition. So with that, let me conclude with the following points. The United States and its allies face the most complicated geopolitical environment since the end of the Cold War. Prime amongst these threats is the expanding Russian and Chinese nuclear arsenals. Uh, and I'll come back to the NPR again, which states, by the 2030s, the United States will, for the first time in its history, face two major nuclear powers as strategic competitors and potential adversaries, end quote. The U.S. nuclear modernization program is critical to deterring this evolving threat and the success of the tritium extraction and plutonium pit production missions at SRS are critical to the success of the overall U.S. nuclear modernization program. On the SRS landlord transition, EM and NSA have established an integrated team to ensure a seamless transition from EM to NNSA. And as part of that transition, DOE is committed to actively consulting with the local community and keeping you informed throughout the process. So with that, uh, thank you for your time and attention this morning and for the community's long-standing support for the security of our nation. And with that, let me turn it over to Ike, uh, who has a few remarks, and then uh, we'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Ike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Frank. Morning. So I'm going to make my communications director a little bit nervous here and go off script. Um, <laughs> I do have prepared remarks, and they're really good remarks, so, um, and I'll, I'll use a lot of them. So um, it wasn't work wasted, Eric, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, I just want to say a couple of things, and then I'll keep my comments brief, actually, so that Frank and I can hear from all of you this morning, because I think, you know, as Frank noted, part of our, our, our reason for being here is so that we can get input from all of you on this very important transition process. So I want to make sure we leave a little bit of time to be able to, to do that this morning. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things up front, though, and, and make sure that they're clear um, as, as we go into this process. First of all, I want to say thank you. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of experience working on the NNSA side. Um, most recently, for the last three years and uh, nine months, roughly, um, I've been with the Environmental Management Program. And one of the things that, that I learned over the course of the last three plus years is just how important the relationships we have with the local communities are and with the states and with the congressional delegation relative to that cleanup program. When I look at how we're making progress across the country and I look at how well the cleanup program is performing, there is in fact a very direct correlation between the level of alignment we have and the strength of those relationships and just how much progress we're able to make. Um, and and no, no place for me typifies that more than Savannah River. I mean, if you think about the, the, the scope of what we do and, and why that alignment is so important, and I see a number of you here this morning who kind of represent, and I, I chatted with a few of you earlier, just why that is. 
um, every aspect of what we do um, connects somehow to the local community. Uh, we work with the school systems and the local colleges to make sure that we have the workforce that we need to do the work that we do going forward. Frank and I are getting an opportunity to see some of that over the next couple of days. That is a very robust process here, and you guys do a great job at helping the department ensure that we have the folks we need to do uh, have to do the, do the cleanup program. We have great alignment with the community and with the local elected officials and through the Citizens Advisory Board connections to the community. Um, and we get good support from our congressional delegation uh, on the cleanup program as well. So there's a, it's easy for me to go to the Hill and make the case to your delegation and the rest of Congress on why the cleanup program is so important and what it is that we're doing when I have that alignment with all of you in terms of what that program looks like. You guys do a great job of supporting the local small business community. Um, for those of you who are in that community, you know how much we rely not just on our primary contractors, but also on the many small businesses who help us get work done on a day-to-day -day basis. Folks like Stuart couldn't do his job if, if, if all of you weren't here helping provide the things that, that we don't have necessarily in-house at the sites. So I wanted to start out just by saying thank you. I really appreciate that level of support. Um, and part of the reason that I want to make sure I emphasize it is because the cleanup program is going to continue to need it uh, along with NNSA. The fact that we're transitioning overall responsibility for the site doesn't mean that we're done with cleanup at Savannah River. When I look at the scope of work that we have left, it's going to take more than a decade, um, and, and in some cases, uh, perhaps even up to a couple of decades. And it's a fairly extensive uh, body of work. We have tens of millions of gallons of tank waste still left to uh, treat, as Mike knows. We have surplus plutonium to dispose of. We have facilities to do D&D &D on. It's a, it's a very significant body of work over an extended period of time that we still have to do. So the fact that we're transitioning and, and moving landlord responsibilities over to, over to NSA does not mean that we think we're done. And so that, that alignment and that support is something we're going to continue to need to be successful. So I wanted to make sure I, I take time to um, ask you guys to, to, to make sure that we continue to communicate and maintain that alignment on the cleanup program uh, going forward. I wanted to close by just uh, highlighting um, a couple of things. Frank noted that we have a, an integrated project team. I want to highlight a couple of folks who are here today leading that team um, and, and sort of note why that team is so important to us. The, we have two executives, one from EM and one from NNSA, who are leading the team. And these folks were very carefully chosen because they have the, the experience that I think we need to be really successful with this effort. Um, locally, Jeff Allison with, with NNSA is probably the, the executive within DOE who has the most combined experience between EM and NNSA at Savannah River. There's probably nobody other than Jeff who has more experience than he does for both programs at this site. Uh, Randy Hendrickson, who's our, 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 our lead for EM, um, has an extraordinary wealth of experience within the department. Uh, he's, he ran the management and budget functions for NNSA. He was the department's chief financial officer. And at a headquarters level, he has extraordinary experience understanding how to move the things that really matter to, to make stuff happen, people and money. Um, and so the, the combined expertise of, of Randy and, and, and Jeff are something that we're going to rely on to be successful with this effort. And the fact that we're, we're putting our best folks forward to make sure that we're successful is an indication of just how important that is to, to both of us to be successful with the effort. So with that, I promised I would keep my remarks brief. My apologies to Eric for going a tiny bit off script. Um, and I will turn it back over so that we can hear from all of you and, and take your questions. But again, thank you. Thank you for your very long-running support of the cleanup program. And thank you in advance for the next couple of decades of support for the cleanup program here at Savannah River. Thank you, Frank and Ike, for that, those wonderful remarks. And, and we appreciate being able to uh, to work with you within within this community to get uh, uh, questions going. I'm, let me just start off with one: um, Is there a transition time frame that we're talking about? To, have you come up with when this stuff's all going to begin? So the uh, two two pieces of the framework. One is um, we've asked uh, Randy and Jeff to get back to us by this summer with what the framework is going to look like. So part of the, the effort between now and the summer is to start putting together the details of exactly what it is that we're going to need to do and what that implementation plan is going to look like. The goal is to get this done by 2025. Right? 
So part of that will be informed, of course, by exactly what it is that we think we need to do. So we reserve the right, once we really understand that, to make some tweaks around the, the, the final date. But the goal is to, is to get this done in the 2025 time frame. Yeah, no, I mean, FY25 right. for us is the goal to move the transition. Right. And that's really important because, believe it or not, we are starting in a couple of months to put together the FY25 budget. Right. It seems like the FY22 budget was just done. Yes. And now we're on the FY25 budget. But like, I, like uh, Ike said, I think we've got two very good teams working closely together, and our objective is to have a seamless transition. All right, do, we, do we have any questions? Does somebody have a question in the audience? There's, okay. John? My question has to do with the lab. Uh, where, who's going to wind up funding that, the laboratory? So, so one of the things that, that um, for, for EM, the Savannah River National Laboratory is our primary laboratory, right? And it's not just a cleanup program here at Savannah River that's going to take place over the next 10 or 20 years. We have important work across the country, places like Hanford, for example, that's going to take the next 60 to 80 years, where we need laboratory R&D support to be able to be successful with that work across the country. So for now, um, you, you know, EM needs to, to, to retain its laboratory. They're, they're also, for those of you who don't know, um, the head of what we call the EMLM network of laboratories. So they're not just the laboratory that does a lot of work for us. They're also our focal point for reaching into the rest of the DOE laboratory system to support our cleanup work across the country, whether it's um, our tank waste mission here or our tank waste work at Nevada or, or at Hanford or our soil and groundwater programs at places like Nevada. Um, so for now, the, the, we need the laboratory support within the cleanup program. So the intent is to, for EM to continue to manage the laboratory. Other questions? Oh, come on. Somebody's got to have one. Okay. Good morning. Thanks for the great overview of NNSA and EM. My thought might be a bit uh, out of the scope of the conversation, but since we're fishing for questions, I'll just throw it out anyway. <laughs> I was wondering if had there had been any thought about um, establishing an enduring cybersecurity mission at SRS, um, kind of thinking about the, uh, the mission that you laid out for NNSA and our geographic um, proximity to NNSA across the river and then um, the uh, upcoming uh, Dreamport cybersecurity system at USCA and the AMC, and then also our growing um, entrepreneur high tech ecosystem that's growing. It seems that like it would be synergistic to kind of take advantage of uh, completing that triangle between business, community, and government. You know, that's actually a, a great question. And let me kind of take you back to my confirmation hearing at the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, Senator Kang, who's the chairman of the uh, Strategic Forces Subcommittee, really was, is focused on cyber. And he said, Mr. Rose, what are you going to do to solve the cyber problem at NNSA? And I looked at him and I said, well, sir, cyber is one of my highest priorities. Uh, we're going to hire a new CIO. And you know what Senator uh, King told me? He said, Mr. Rose, if you don't fix this, I know where you're, you live, and I'm coming for you. Uh, and you can actually watch it on. It's all online. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, cyber has been one of uh, Jill Ruby and my number one priorities. Indeed, my first meeting at NNSA uh, was to meet with the new CIO to talk about an independent assessment of NNSA cyber capabilities. The Institute of Defense Analysis did that for us, and that informed our budget going forward. Indeed, we have been uh, making significant new investments in our cyber capabilities. Uh, I think since 2022, our cyber budget has grown about 15 or 20 percent because quite bluntly, we haven't made the investments we should have had, and um, our adversaries, as I mentioned uh, earlier, they're looking for vulnerabilities. Um, th so I think it's a good news story. Uh, we are working it hard. Now, to your specific point about Savannah River, um, my CIO has been down here a couple of times, and he's also uh, gone down to Fort Gordon, which I think is outside of Augusta, which is the Army's uh, cyber hub. 
Uh, we're looking to do more, and I will actually take this back because, like you said, there's a lot of synergies here in, in this area, uh, and we should take advantage of the synergies that we have, uh, especially because we have, it's so difficult to recruit cyber talent. I mean, if you ask me what I'm most concerned about across the complex, it's recruiting quality people. Uh, and it's not just cyber and IT, it's getting skilled craftspeople to work on these construction projects. That's why these local partnerships with the community colleges and other organizations are, are so critical. Um, and we're facing this across the entire department. I mean, getting skilled workers who can do these really important jobs. Because we as a country really didn't invest in them. And, uh, but I think this is one of the highlights of this community. I, I mentioned when I came down here in 2021 just how I would say impressed I was with everything you do to develop that pipeline. And I will make this promise to you, is once NNSA becomes the landlord for SRS, we will continue to make those investments because your success in the community's success is critical to our success. Great, thank you. Uh, question. Yep. Uh, you talked about the workforce. Yeah. So the transition itself is more complicated than just flipping a switch. And while that transition is happening, NNSA is going to have a huge buildup in workforce. How are you going to handle those two things? And how do you go, are, are you, how will you connect back to the community so that we have the right housing, yeah. the right education programs, the right schools and the healthcare system yeah. to support this growth that's coming? Yeah, I mean, I don't have great answers right now, um, but you're absolutely right. We are going to be ramping up the mission. Uh, that's going to require more people. Uh, it's going to require infrastructure. Uh, and what I would say is this. Uh, though we are at the early parts of this transition, one of the reasons Ike and I are down here today is to begin that discussion with the local community so we can get your input. So five years down the road, we don't say, oh, we need all this supporting infrastructure. We want to do this in a consultative manner that as the transition is developing, we're building those needs in early. Are we going to get everything right on the first try, no. But you do have my personal commitment, and I'll, I'll make a commitment to come on down later in the year, that we will listen within the authorities that we have. We will try to ensure that your priorities are addressed. Because again, if you're not successful, we're not going to be successful. Ike, anything you'd like to add? No, I mean, and, and certainly, you know, as NNSA grows its mission, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the EM mission is, is not on a sharp decline. It's, it's going to be steady for at least another decade or so. Um, and so, you know, those are things we're going to continue to need to work together on because collectively, right, our need for support is going to grow over the course of the, yeah. of the next decade. And, and I think it's really important that this will be an enduring mission. Uh, pit production, tritium extraction, is on the critical path for the U.S. Strategic Nuclear Modernization Program. If we don't get these missions right, we have bigger problems. Okay, I, I have another one just quick. Uh, we mentioned about the laboratory and uh, the transfer hope, uh, expectation that it'll probably stay with the environmental management. How about Centera, the security contractor, the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory, Amoresco, which is the uh, power biofuel power plant. Any any thought at this time on on how those might shake out? No, no, that is that is the, the the thing we need to study with it with it, the implementation plan, right? So this is the thing that Randy and 
and, and Frank need to make sure they look very carefully at because it, it's, we have a number of, of contracts. I mean, the, the, the one for certain that you're going to transfer is the M&O, which is the, sort of the primary landlord contract for the site. Um, the one you're absolutely not going to transfer is the liquid waste contract because that's um, completely an e-emission, right? But in between that space, as, as you point out, there are a lot of contracts that support both of those missions. And so we need, we need to look carefully at what, what that will look like. And it may not be a, a point in data time, right? You may not say, okay, well, in 2025, we do all this and then we're done. You might say in 2025, we get this started, we do this piece of work, and then over the next decade, we sequence other, other transfers and other pieces of work as the mission uh, profiles shift over, over that time frame. So it may not be a point in time or a single answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh. <coughs> Red, red okay. Frank, what would you say is the greatest difference in management philosophy and practice between NNSA and uh, EM? Well, given that I have not worked in EM, I'm going to pass that one to Ike, but let me uh, kind of give you a few thoughts on NNSA. Um, you know, our mission is a little bit different than EM, um, and we operate a little bit differently because we are really focused on building nuclear weapons. Um, and as a result, we're not able to share as much information as EM can um, because it's of a classified nature. However, what I would say is, is this. Uh, we have a long history of operating in communities around the country. Um, we understand that it is important to engage the local community. We understand that your success, may, is, our success is dependent on your success. So I would say things will be a, a little bit different than how we currently do community outreach than uh, how EM does it because of the nature of our work. However, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, we operated the site until 1995. So I think for people of a certain age, they can understand how, uh, how we operate it. And my understanding is the community, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was, was fairly happy with the engagement when uh, defense programs uh, ran the site. And, and secondly, we're here today. Uh, you know, um, Jason and Jeff give us weekly reports of all the things that they're doing in the community. And quite frankly, I am impressed with just how engaged they are, whether it's with the local government here, the governor and his team. Uh, and again, the, the, the promise that I will make to you is this. Though we might not do things exactly how EM has done them, there will be close and continual engagement with an NSA. Now, he's worked in both, so I'll, I'll, I'll defer to him on the differences between EM and an NSA. Thank you, Frank. Um, <laughs> so how candid should I be? Uh, that, that's actually a really good question, and as, as Frank pointed out, I. Um, before I moved over to EM, I actually spent um, several years as the senior career executive for NNSA, so I have um, uh, uh, experience with both. I, I will just highlight a couple of things in addition to the, the sort of the, the, the one thing Frank pointed out about transparency, because I think there are a couple of things that are, that are important as you think about why we're doing this now um, and, and what that might mean relative to, to the programs going forward. One is when you look at how NNSA's mission uh, is laid out versus what EM's missions are. The, the thought underlying NNSA's missions is they're going to continue indefinitely, right? The idea behind EM's missions is that we're there to do a task and get it done and then be done because we want the cleanup work to actually be cleaned up. And if you look around the country, we started out with over 100 sites, we're down to 15. So we, I mean, our goal is to make progress and actually get the cleanup work done. Um, when you think about how you manage a site, that creates a, a, a difference in how you think about things like infrastructure, right? Um, because as you look and you think about what you want to maintain and how you want to maintain it, your outlook and your approach to how you do those things is very different 
when you're looking to end at a certain date in the future and be done versus when you've got a continuing mission that's going to last indefinitely. So your approach and, and your thought process as you think about how you invest in those types of things um, can be a little bit, little bit different. The other thing that, that um, is, at least for me, was a little bit of an, an, an epiphany is sort of how we manage programs. Um, on the NNSA side, you know, Frank pointed out kind of the national security importance of what they do. But the programs are developed you know, with an interagency process and they're, they're national programs in their scale and their scope. Um, and a lot of that program development is driven by national needs and, and then you focus at a site level on executing to make sure that those big picture national things come together and that they happen. Um, from an EM perspective, a lot of our program really is site specific. It's not, I mean, there's a big picture national program that we're trying to do cleanup everywhere, but the exact scope of what that work looks like is often a very local program depending on the legacy of what happened here. So we focus a lot of our program management as well as our, our execution locally and not just nationally. For us, that's one of the reasons that I mentioned earlier why alignment with the community is so important because the program that we're doing in large part is being done um, for the community, um, and so making sure that we work with the community on what that program looks like and have that alignment is a fundamental part of our, of our program management activities. So I, from my perspective, that's kind of what I see as the big picture differences. Otherwise, in terms of day-to-day -day details, you will find a lot of, of, of the same types of uh, former nuclear operators and Navy nukes. And so a lot of the, the, the mindset of the rigor of nuclear activities and nuclear operations and the day-to-day -day operational mindset is remarkably similar. Let's go to Shark Command. First, <clears throat> thanks for being here. Just being here says a lot about the transition and where we, where we might go. My question is about congressional aspect of this. Do you imagine that there be a change in budget lines or in relationships between committees and that sort of thing? And, 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 and will that impact us? Is there anything we should do about that? Um, Chuck, that's a great question. I mean, as you know, there is a lot of polarization in Washington right now. Uh, but one of the things that I like to point out is if you look at nuclear policy, there's a lot of continuity. Uh, indeed, uh, if you look at the Obama 2010 nuclear posture review, the Trump 2018 nuclear posture review, and the Biden 2022 nuclear posture review, though uh, there are nuances that are different, the fundamental line runs through. And that is, we need to modernize our strategic nuclear arsenal, maintain a triad, and uh, upgrade our warheads in infrastructure. Uh, so what I like to say, nuclear modernization is one of the few strong bipartisan programs in Washington. Uh, indeed, we received, I think, almost $800 million more than NNSA, uh, the president requested for NNSA last year. And I anticipate that bipartisan support in Congress and across administrations to continue because at the end of the day, this is a long-term pro uh, process. And for us to, for it to be sustainable, it needs to have bipartisan support. And I think for this program, based on what I have seen, is that bipartisan support is there. I say this not because we're at the old fogies table, <laughs> <laughs> but this question is for both of you all. Uh, in light of the manpower shortage, do you all have programs to tap into? I mean, there are a lot of gray beards and uh, gray heads around here. Do you have a, uh, any programs that are ex in existence that uh, can utilize this knowledge? Uh, that, that's a good question, and certainly at a at, at a at a big picture level, we're, we're very much focused on the issue. I mean, it, it's an issue for us across the country, as, as Frank pointed out, not just here at Savannah River. Um, I, I think, you know, we need to pay attention to every possible um, opportunity 
to deal with the problem, right? And, and one possible opportunity is to convince folks who maybe previously thought that they were um, done with the work environment, right, to sort of get back and be re-energized and rethink that. Um, we have different programs at different sites with different contractors to do, to do that. Um, I'm not aware of a sort of a national type program that we have, but certainly a lot of our, um, you know, on the federal side, for example, we have the ability to go back and get retired annuitants who come back in and we do that routinely. Um, we've looked at things like having uh, uh, dual encumbering of positions and we've started to do that more frequently on the federal side where we, we allow ourselves to, to hire people before the people that we have on board actually leave so we can do as much of that knowledge transfer as possible. Um, I think our contractors are doing similar activities uh, around the country. Um, so I don't know if that's a direct answer to your question, but that's, that's what I think you were asking. So. Yeah. And, and I would just add, if you look at the challenges we face over the next couple of years, my biggest concern is workforce. Um, not just recruiting people, but retaining people. Uh, and you would be surprised at how much of my time, Jill Ruby's time, uh, the senior management's time is focused on this. Because we can have all the money in the world, the best programs, but if we can't recruit and retain people, um, it's not going to be a success. Now, um, this is a tough time, and I think everyone uh, is going through similar challenges. You know, our approach, and it kind of goes to your question, is we need to be flexible and creative. Uh, I always say, when you look at the challenges that we face, and again, I highly recommend this uh, report if you want to ruin it, but it really says to me is we cannot leave talent on the table. We, given the threats that we face, need to uh, tap into all the talent in the nation, uh, regardless of race, age, gender. Uh, we have serious existential threats that the country is facing. Uh, but one of our great strengths as a country is the diversity across the nation, and we need to make sure we tap into that. All right, I have one, one other question back here. Good morning. Uh, my question actually has to do with the acquiring and retention of people. Um, in this post-COVID era where teleworking has been much more, has become a much more robust thing for most companies, does NNSA have a stance? on that particular issue? Yeah, uh, you know, listen, we are in a new world um, and we are going to have to adjust. Now, a good amount of our uh, workforce does telework. However, given our mission and the need to deal with classified information, um, not everyone can telework uh, all the time uh, just because we cannot bring classified information home uh, we have to do it in certain <laughs> we have to do it in certain secure locations <laughs> So what I would say is, is this, the, the, the approach that Jill, Ruby, and I have laid out for NNSA is kind of what I call the use your common sense approach. Um, you, you know, in my view, uh, I got to be in every day because that's just the nature of the job I have. When the White House calls, when the secretary calls, uh, we, you know, we need to be on call, but not everyone needs to be on call all the time. So I would say the approach NNSA will take will be a flexible approach, consistent with the uh, guidance that we have um, from, from OPM and others. 
uh, to make sure that we can retain people. Because, uh, you know, listen, I understand we are in a very competitive work environment where we're competing with others for talent. Uh, and I think uh, at the same time, we have a mission that is unique and, you know, uh, these, a lot of these private companies don't necessarily have that mission. So we, we have to find the right balance and uh, that is the approach I think NNSA will do. All right, let's take one more. Oh, maybe two more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, first, let me say, as a member of the local cab, we have appreciated how DOE handles our requests, providing information, providing assistance when we need it, that sort of thing. How do you see, given, given that the cab's whole mission is environmental management and not the other side, um, do you see the cab changing? Do you see it going away? Well, here, here's what I would say. Um, as Ike noted earlier, he may have a couple of points uh, on this, is that the environmental mission will remain at Savannah River after the transition. And for environmental issues, the cab will continue to operate as it does today. Uh, we at NNSA, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, have a somewhat different mission. On the other hand, we also appre appreciate the need to have a mechanism to consult with the local community. We're in the process of working through how we will do that uh, in the, during the, as part of the transition process. Uh, but I will say this, we will have some type of mechanism uh, at the appropriate time, uh, but we're not there yet. We haven't figured out how we will do that. But anything else you'd have to add? No, I mean, I'll, I'll just um, reiterate what I, what I mentioned earlier, that the, the EM mission here at the site is going to continue you know, well past the next decade. A fundamental part of, of, as I mentioned earlier, of how we think about EM programs is it, you know those programs are all locally developed and our citizens advisory boards are a very important mechanism for us to get community input into what those priorities are and how that program looks going forward and there's 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 no change in that here at savannah river so from an em perspective we certainly intend to continue to work with um, and value the input we get from our local citizens advisory board here for the foreseeable future thank you very much for your time today and i hope everybody has a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend thank you so much Today's episode of the Gone Fission Nuclear Report is brought to you by Floor. We're building a better world.